It always comes back to him. Absolutely. Isn't it? He's the only way, and you can have complete assurance in complete him. Complete assurance. Absolutely. Because of Jesus Christ. Yep. The, the sin and salvation, you know where you're going. It's only in the and Bible. And what is it you have to do? What's the one thing you have to do? Do you have to pay some money? Just accept Jesus, trust him. So that's yep. it. Folks, can you see? Joanna has assurance of salvation. We've prophesied today. We've done preaching. We've done wonderful works. We've cast out devils in your name. Look, are these people claiming the name of Jesus? Yeah. Have they called Jesus Lord? Yeah. Are they doing a lot of wonderful works in Jesus' name? Yeah. So why in the world are they cast out? Why are they not allowed into heaven? What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Say it with gusto. Jesus. Come on, do it louder than that. Jesus. Jesus. Here is what it says with regards to salvation in the Bible for the born again Christians. The born again Christians who sin will lose the salvation according to the Bible, Lizzie. It says in John, in 1 John chapter 3, from verse 4 to 10, it says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Do the Christians continue to sin? Of course they do after they become born again because they are not sinless. It says here, yeah, no one who's, do you not sin at all? Of course you do. No one who's, who is born again will continue to sin because God's seed, God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Amen. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Yes, do the Christians sin by not doing what God told them to? Yes, they do. Many things. And this is what is is saying in the Bible. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Are there Christians who do not love their brothers and sister? Yes, there are many. So you see, these born-again Christians, their salvation is not guaranteed based on that verse. It's actually taken away from them if they come in and sin, or if they do not love their brother and sister. So there you go, Lizzie. That is the Well, can I suggest to you four lessons this evening from the parable of the ten virgins? First, that's an awful message of the parable, isn't it? Here they are, the bridesmaids, and they stand, as I say, for those of us who on the face of it are Christians, people who call ourselves Christians, people who come to church, people who take communion, people who have been baptized, perhaps people who read their Bibles, people who pray, perhaps people like me who are a clergy people. But notice this, that not all of them really care about Christ. Some of them do. Some of them put their flowers in the water. Some of them in the original bring extra oil for their lamps because in this wedding of all weddings, they don't want to be caught out. They care for him. They see the privilege that they've been given. And yet some of them don't. Careless. Foolish. Foolish ones, verse 8 calls them. Not wise, but foolish. And that's not just a mistake. They're culpably careless because they've been given this extraordinary privilege and they've treated it as if it was nothing. What a mixed bag the church is. We can all look the same as the bridesmaids did sleeping there in that room. And yet what's really going on can be so different. On the one hand, we can be those who seek Christ first, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, who can sing the song we've just sing, sung, Christ Christ is enough. 
all I need and mean it. And yet at the same time we can be those who come to church regularly and have never yet known him personally. Or perhaps have turned to him at some point in the past and yet have lost our first love for him. No longer take him as seriously as perhaps once we did. Don't, if we're being honest, care for him more than anything else. Don't look forward to his return as the greatest thing, the thing for which we need to be prepared. What a mixed bag is the Christian church. And then thirdly, what a moment of truth there is going to be one day. That's the point of the parable, isn't it? When Christ comes again, there is going to be a great moment of truth. It's partly what we're always remembering on Advent Sunday. And as, as I say, we're doing that a week early. There they are. They look the same. The ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids in my version of the story. And yet, what is hidden will then become totally clear. He will draw back a veil on reality and it will become absolutely clear who has really been his and who has not. Who has been living as one longing for his coming, prepared for it, and who has been careless about his coming, unprepared. What a moment of truth there's going to be one day. I remember myself years ago having some very, very important exams and for one reason or another, perhaps you've had an experience like this in your life, for one reason or another I came to them totally unprepared. They were very important exams and as I sat down to do them I knew that they would be a disaster. It was a terrible feeling. And it is nothing to the feeling that we will have on the day when he returns if it is then revealed that we are foolish virgins, unwise bridesmaids, who have not lived for his return. And then finally, what a personal rejection there's going to be on that day. See, I think people are often shocked by this as they read the parable. The Christ should say such personally rejecting things. Verse 12, he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. People think it's unfair. It's a mistake. Surely he should have been more generous. Allow them in. Let them just slip into the limousines or the carriages. Does it really matter? But that's to miss both the point the parable is making about these foolish bridesmaids and to miss the point of the wedding feast. See, the feast is for those who care above all things for the bridegroom. Sing it with gusto! Jesus! Come on, do it louder than that! Jesus! Your salvation is dependent on believing the in the crucifixion and uh, basically the, uh, the uh, yeah the, the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus. Then why we, why does in Mark 3:29 we read this? But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. So G so Lizzie, there you go. You will not be forgiven. Even the blood of Jesus cannot wipe that out. You will be eternally in hellfire if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And this is what Mark 3.29 says. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Folks, can you see? Joanna has assurance of salvation.